Hi everyone, this is Miss Lazar, and I'm excited to give you a lecture on rocks and mining. Here's our flow for this lecture. We're going to start with the rock cycle, then we'll talk about types of surface and subsurface mining, think about the impacts of mining, how to clean up mining, and can we use mineral really resources more sustainably? How should we think about that? So we're going to start with the rock cycle, and I'm hoping that this is something that's really familiar to you. I'm hoping that you're already familiar with the idea that rock starts as magma deep underground. When that magma rises to the surface, it cools, and that cooled magma is called igneous rock. Uh, as that igneous rock and the other surface rocks get eroded, all of that eroded rock particles, they get washed into a body of water, especially the ocean. And as we have layers of that sediment, those rock particles build up over time, those layers press down on each other. And eventually they press down on each other so much that through compaction and cementation, those layers of sediment turn into sedimentary rock. But that sedimentary rock is not done being buried. More sediment can pile up on top of it. Tectonic plate movements can shift it even deeper underground. And so when that sedimentary rock gets exposed to even higher temperatures and higher pressures, it gets converted into metamorphic rock. And that metamorphic rock is formed deep underground. Um, it can be uplifted to the surface of the earth, just like the sedimentary rock can be through tectonic plate movements. But if that metamorphic rock or any other rock gets deep enough to the center of the earth, it will melt back into magma and our cycle will start again. So take a moment and just notice a couple of things about this rock cycle. First, although we have three different kinds of rock and they sort of seem to flow one into each other, um, they can all be uplifted to the surface at any point in time. Additionally, they can all be eroded at any point in time. So take a minute, make sure you've got a complete rock cycle in your notes. Here are some extra facts. Igneous rock can be formed above ground, like we think of rock that's formed as magma comes out of a volcano, or it can be formed below ground. It just needs to get cool enough to harden. So if it gets extruded just below the surface of the earth where it's cool enough for that rock to cool down into solid rock, it can still be igneous rock. And sedimentary rock, although this diagram shows it kind of being ma mostly made from eroded igneous rock, it can be made from eroded particles of any other type of rock that's on the surface with it. Finally, the way to recognize metamorphic rock, metamorphic rocks are the crystalline ones. And now is a good time for me to show you some examples of each of these type of rocks. So our first type of rock is igneous rock. Basalt and pumice are igneous rocks that both form above the surface. Pumice gets this crazy porous structure because pumice is formed when magma drops directly into water and that water is so much cooler compared to the temperature of the magma that any gases that are in the magma expand really rapidly and form all these bubbles in the pumice. Basalt also forms above ground. Obsidian and granite are both igneous rocks that form and cool below ground. And one of the key tip-offs is if it forms below ground, it's going to be shinier. And you can see that obsidian and granite have had uh, more time to cool. They've cooled more slowly, and that's what gives them a shinier appearance. Our metamorphic rocks, remember I said are the crystalline ones. Here's a sampler of metamorphic rocks. The way to recognize their crystalline structure, because these don't look like diamonds or gems, is how they break. Look at our garnet here. Notice how it breaks along these facets. It breaks along those facets naturally. Same with our storolite down here. It breaks along facets. Our corundum breaks along facets. It's got a, a clear, um, in this case, it's a hexagonal shape. This one is also hexagonal. Garnet is, is multifaceted, more than just a, a single um, prism shape. And our sedimentary rocks are the ones that look like you glued a bunch of stuff together. So this is pudding stone. And this forms when larger rocks are embedded within silt-like sediment. And so the silt-like sediment is essentially the glue that is forming the concrete holding these larger rocks together. Sedimentary rock also includes these incredible layered rocks that you can see in canyons. And the clue that this is sedimentary rock is all of the layers. You can see the layers of sediment that have been built up over time.
So that's what to know about the rock cycle. Just think about the slow process that generates all these different forms of rock. But our focus today is rocks and mining. So we got to get there. What else is in the ground beside rock? Mineral resources. And we've got two types of mineral resources. Our metallic mineral resources include things like iron. Iron is useful in steel production. These are steel bars. And actually to generate steel, you mix iron with another metallic resource like manganese or chromium. And that addition makes it much stronger and harder. So you can see this bank vault door that is made out of steel that is a mixture of iron and manganese. We've got other mineral resources like aluminum that can be used in packaging, like aluminum cans, and also in large-scale building projects and construction. Copper. Copper conducts electricity, and so we use it in electrical and communications wiring. Gold also conducts electricity. We think about gold as only being used in things like jewelry, but gold is actually a large part of our electronics. You can see it in the circuit board here. And by the way, if you haven't been taking note of some of the things that these mineral resources are used for, it may be good just to record a couple so that you've got a bank of reasons why we mine different metallic mineral resources. On the flip side, we've got our non-metallic mineral resources. Again, gather a couple examples so that you've got a bank of them to use. Limestone is a non-metallic mineral resource that we mine. When you crush limestone and burn it, you generate a key ingredient of cement. Uh, similarly, sand and gravel, we mine them. We can use them as is in many different construction projects, but when you mix sand and gravel and cement from limestone, you get concrete. This is concrete. Phosphate salts are non-metallic mineral resources that we mine. We use phosphate salts in fertilizer and also in some detergents like laundry detergent. And finally, we've got other things like Diamonds. This is a non-metallic mineral resource. We could use this in jewelry, but diamond also has a really important industrial purpose as the world's hardest substance. We have things like diamond bit drill tips that we use to drill through granite and other stones, um, metals, other things that are hard and need a hard substance to drill through them. So ore is a rock that we can profitably extract a mineral resource from. Ore is what we take out of the ground. And right here, I've got two gold-rich ores, but you can see there's an obvious difference between them. Here, you can actually see the gold. Here, you can't see the gold. So this is a high-grade ore. A high-grade ore is one that has the, the mineral resource in a high concentration. This is a low-grade ore. The mineral resource in question is in a much lower concentration. So just thinking about processing, which of these would require more processing to extract a profitable amount? Definitely the low-grade ore. We would have to process way more low-grade ore to get a profitable amount of gold as opposed to if we were processing high-grade ore. Uh, one more vocabulary term. This is a map of all of the gold reserves on earth. And I chose gold because that's a, a good mineral to talk about when we're looking at mining and mining impacts. Um, but we could generate a reserves map for any mineral resource that we wanted. This shows the worldwide distribution of gold deposits. And reserves are all of these places that are identified. These are the identified deposits of mineral resources that we can profitably extract. So it's actually pretty hard to find a true reserves map because most countries will not want to show you exactly where their mineral deposits are. But this is an approximate gold deposit map that shows the reserves of gold. You can imagine that there's other gold on Earth, but it's not part of the reserves because we can't profitably extract it yet. For example, there's a lot of gold in the deep ocean. We can't get there. So imagine we've taken our metal. What, what is the life cycle of this metal? Well, we start with mining to get the metal out of the ground. We dig up a bunch of rock that we know is uh, 
probably high grade ore, rich in that mineral resource. And now we're left with all of this ore. You can see in this picture, this is iron ore. Um, you can actually see some of the oxidized iron mixed into this rock. Well, we need to separate out the rock from the iron or whatever mineral resource we're looking for. So if we're going to separate them, we're going to use a variety of physical and chemical separation methods to pull our metal away from our waste materials. And that method will be highly dependent on the type of metal we're trying to extract. Iron, for example, is magnetic, and we can use that property to help us extract it. When we grind up a bunch of iron-rich rock, we can use high-powered magnets to separate out the magnetic iron filings from the non-magnetic rock material. If we're trying to separate out gold, we can use its heavy weight. Gold is extremely dense and heavy for its size, and gold will just separate itself naturally by gravity away from the lighter rock materials that it's mixed with. So our physical and chemical separation uh, will be highly dependent on the on the metal that we're trying to extract. We've gotten most of our metal extracted, but it's not purified yet at this point. To purify our metal, we send it to the smelting uh, in industry. Our smelting industry will take our non-purified metal and will essentially burn it. The goal is to heat it up to high enough temperatures that anything that is not metal is completely burned away. And that uh, non-metal that's burned away is called slag that'll be shipped out. This is probably hazardous waste and we'll talk about that more in our pollution unit. One thing to note about smelting uh, is how how much air pollution it generates. Smelting is one of the largest air polluting industries in the United States. So at the end of smelting, however, we've gotten our molten purified metal and now we're ready to melt down our metal pour it into molds and turn it into our end product, like the body of a car. That end product will serve its lifespan. And when the product is done being used, maybe the car engine is no longer working and the owner just wants to get rid of the car. We've got two options. Our metal could be discarded in a landfill or our metal could be recycled. So what does recycling actually mean? Well, think about this metal in the car. It's probably covered with a couple of layers of paint, other plastic substances. We, got, we have to purify this metal again before we can use it for something else. So which is our metal purification step? Smelting. That means that when we recycle a metal, we are sending it back to the smelters. Again, think about what I said about smelting. It is extremely air polluting. Recycling is something that gets a better reputation than it deserves. Ideally, we should be reusing our metal products for as long as we can uh, before we have to send them back to be smelted. Some people hear this and they're like, well, why do we even bother recycling if it's so environmentally degrading? Let's just throw it out and mine some more. Well, <laughs> this mining process is even more environmentally degrading than the smelting process is. Worst case scenario, we can go with recycling. And remember, these are all non-renewable resources. So if we continue to discard our metallic objects, we're going to run out of metal resources to mine. How do we get those metals and other resources out of the earth? Mining, we mine them out. We've got two different types of mining. Surface mining, where all of the material over a mineral resource is removed to expose the mineral resource that's below. And subsurface mining, where tunnels and shafts are dug to reach and remove min minerals underground. You can see in this picture a coal mine. This is a subsurface coal mine, which is one of our most common subsurface mining types. Not the only one, though. So let's talk more about surface mining. Uh, remember I said surface mining is defined by removing all of the land and stuff above your mineral resource. Well, this land and stuff has a name. It's a very mining specific name that conveys miners feelings toward this land. It's called overburden. This is the soil and rock overlying a mineral deposit. It's over the mineral deposit and it's a burden. Let's get rid of it. This is also the intact soil and ecosystem. Once we pull all of that overburden off, we're probably using bulldozers, excavators, a variety of heavy machinery equipment, um, that pile of waste, so the pile of 
trees, rocks, gravel, stones, everything that's in this overburden that's just been dumped in a big mountain off to the side of our mine site, that is now called spoils or tailings. Uh, This is the piles of removed overburden and waste rock material from physical separation. So we've got our overburden that's shoved off to the side. Eventually we'll get some waste rock material from our our physical separation that'll be added to the pile and that will be a, a spoils or tailings pile. This is a picture of a spoils pile, and I just wanted to throw this in here to give you a size of scale. These spoils piles are literally mountains. They're just mountains of gravel, rock, dirt, uh, and then plants that have been torn up and dumped in a pile. This is actually a smaller spoils pile, and you can't even see where the land originally was. It's underneath the surface of this spoils pile. So When we're choosing a type of surface mining, we actually need to choose it based on the orientation of our mineral deposit. So here are three different mineral deposit scenarios and the corresponding methods of surface mining that we would use. In this situation, the the pink is our mineral deposit that's underground. You can see some beautiful trees that I drew on top of the ground. In this situation, we've got a horizontal deposit that's close to the surface. The type of mining that we would use here is called strip mining. We will just strip off this horizontal layer of overburden to expose our mineral seam right here. Here's a picture of strip mining. You can see how basically as far as the eye can see, we've got, uh, this looks like soil still. We're probably in the C layer at this point because there's a lot of rock mixed in, but we're about to expose our mineral rich layer that's underneath it. If we've got our mineral deposit in a hill, It's very likely that when the hill was formed through tectonic plate movement, the mineral deposit was pushed up just along with the hill. And so we need to somehow expose that mineral deposit. And to do that, we use contour mining. We bulldoze terraces. Those are flat pads that you can see in this image. Look at all of the flat pads that kind of Um, step down the hill. We do a flat pad at the top, another flat pad in a ring a little lower, another flat pad in a ring a little lower, and so on and so forth to expose our mineral seam um, all the way down our hill. What if we have a vertical mineral deposit, like in this last scenario? Well, then we need to build a structure that will allow us to go deep underground without the threat of mineshaft collapse. This is open pit mining. You can see in this image that we've dug an ever widening circle of terraces and the structure of this is is for stability, Um, but this allows us to get deeper and deeper and deeper into the earth. We actually have some open pit mines that are over a mile and a half to two miles deep. These open pit mines can get extremely deep. You may recognize something like this if you've ever seen a quarry. Quarries are typically open pit mines. And this is another type of surface mining that is more common now. Uh, This is called mountaintop removal. Mountaintop removal has only become possible since the invention of extremely large heavy machinery and the industrial use of explosives. So mountaintop removal involves the use of explosives and heavy machinery to remove the top of a mountain. Why would we do this? Well, this is a picture of mountains in West Virginia. And what's hidden in horizontal layers under all of these mountains is a coal seam. This is very common in coal mining. So we've got a horizontal coal seam underneath the top of this mountain. It's not close enough to the surface that we can just strip off the top of the mountain, like the very, very top surface, the first 10, 20 meters. It's much deeper down. Traditionally, we would have used subsurface mining. We would have dug a tunnel uh, to bore into the mountain. We would have dug a shaft all the way across the mountaintop and kind of extracted our coal from underground. But as heavy machinery and industrial explosives have become more widely used and cheaper, it actually becomes way more cost effective to blow off the top of the mountain. This is commonly used in Appalachia. Uh, So the Appalachian Mountains region in West Virginia, in Kentucky, in Tennessee. Um, We have rich coal deposits there. They're underneath these extremely hilly areas and the easiest thing to do is blow off the top of the mountain. Then, so you put in your industrial explosives, you uh, 
detonate them, you have a giant pile of rubble that you'll come in and use a bulldozer to scrape off. And that, we're going to talk more about mountaintop removal um, and its impacts a little later. As you can probably imagine, mountaintop removal and blowing the top off of a mountain uh, does not come without some significant environmental degradation. What if our mineral deposit is underwater? Well, if it's in a shallow body of water, like a stream or a river or a lake, we can access it with something called a dredge. Dredging is what we use to extract mineral resources from shallow bodies of water. This is a floating barge that's got a bucket line coming off of it. These are very heavy cast iron buckets that are used to scoop up our layers of ore inside the dredge itself, we've probably got some physical separation machinery that will help separate away our rock from our mineral of interest. And then we'll be sending our waste material back out underwater where we scraped it up from. Uh, this is definitely something we can use in a shallow body of water. How would we use this in the ocean? We can't. We can't extend our bucket line far enough for this to be of any use in the ocean, which is one reason that ocean mining has not taken off. And now let's transition underground and talk briefly about subsurface mining. So subsurface mining is digging shafts and tunnels underground to extract our mineral resource without destroying the land that's above it. We can still use heavy machinery. You can see we've got a hydraulic excavator here that's boring into our wall. This is actually digging a tunnel further into a coal seam. You can see this dark rock that's around here. This is very coal rich rock. We're continuing to dig a tunnel towards the left. Um, subsurface mining sites are extremely complex operations. The arrangement of tunnels, of shafts, of elevators, of pumps, things to supply air, things to keep air circulation going, safety equipment to keep everybody safe. These are really complex operations, much more logistically complex than a surface mining operation would be. That's actually one of the reasons that subsurface mining is used less frequently now. We only use it if we have to. So let's talk about the impacts of mining. I hope I've done a good job of impressing upon you how much waste is generated in mining. All filling these pictures are spoils. Huge amounts of soil and rock waste are generated in mining. You can see a massive spoils pile here all along the edges of this mine site. This is a gravel and sand mine site. You can see spoils just piling up. Actually, three quarters of all solid waste in the United States is from mining. And that's mostly spoils and tailings. Three quarters of all solid waste in the US is from mining. Let's talk about some more specific impacts. Uh, mining has a massive freshwater requirement. Why are we using freshwater in mining? Well, Water is frequently used in the physical separation process. You can see in this picture over here on the right, this is a wash plant that we're using to separate gold from the non-gold rock. And because of gold's weight, we can use water um, and some complicated machinery to allow our gold to settle while washing away all of our other non-gold rock. It's a very water heavy process. Many of our physical separation and chemical separation processes are. We can also use water um, as part of the mining operation itself. On the left, you see a picture of hydraulic mining, which is now banned. Uh, this was used before dynamite and heavy machinery were used very frequently. You can use a high powered water cannon to blast down chunks of rock. That is now banned. Uh, water is also used in machine cooling. And the general use of fresh water here can absolutely deplete fresh water resources in the region where the mining is happening. Yes, all of this water will eventually return to the watershed of the region it was taken from. Um, however, not before it's had a chance to evaporate. And much of it gets contaminated, as we'll talk about next. So water contamination is a huge issue when it comes to mining operations. When water runs through spoils, 
or tailings or a mine site, it will carry pollutants off with it. So this might be the water that was just running through your wash plant, or this might be the water that flows through your mine site after it rains. It's all water. Either way, the most obvious thing it's going to be carrying with it is sediment. Think about water flowing through a giant pile of soil and gravel. It's going to dissolve away a lot of that soil. It's going to pull a lot of that sediment with it. And you know what's going to happen. That sediment, when it hits a nearby stream or river, it's going to settle down to the bottom and suffocate our uh, lower aquatic ecosystems. The more problematic things that our water can carry with it are acids, and heavy metals. So when water flows through a mine site that's rich in sulfur, coal mining is especially rich in sulfur, but many other minerals are too. Uh, the sulfur that's in our exposed rocks can get dissolved in our water and the sulfur will react with the water itself to form sulfuric acid. And now we have sulfuric acid running off of our mine site and this is called acid mine drainage. That sulfuric acid is uh, a problem on its own for flora and fauna, but the sulfuric acid will also leach heavy metals away from the rocks. And that sulfuric acid will dissolve things like mercury and arsenic into our flowing water as well. And now those will be carried into our watershed as well. Mine sites try to deal with this by using something called a settling pond system. So all of the water that's coming off of our tailings, coming off of our wash plants, is put into giant settling ponds so that the sediment can settle down to the bottom of the settling pond, and then the hopefully clean water on the top can be pumped out into the local watershed. Uh, it doesn't work perfectly. It works pretty well for sediment separation, but when you've got these heavy metal contaminants and acid contaminants, there's no amount of time and settling that's gonna let those settle out. So frequently these settling ponds become um, long-term storage facilities for the water and this water will not be returned to the watershed. That'll just increase our water depletion. Mining has polluted 40% of western watersheds in the United States. This is from a mixture of sediment pollution, acid pollution, and heavy metal pollution as well. As you can see from these pictures, uh, mining has major air pollution impacts as well. The use of heavy machinery will kick up a lot of dust naturally. That dust is harmful to anybody who breathes it in. When you breathe in dust, the smallest dust particles can lodge themselves in your lungs. And if they build up over time, you can be left with uh, irreparable lung damage. The use of heavy machinery also includes the use of fossil fuels that are burnt to power the engines of the heavy machinery. And that will cause the release of carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and other air pollutants as well. And the smelting process, as I mentioned before, releases a massive array of toxic chemicals. Um, we are going to have an entire unit on air pollution, so don't stress about these details now. We will be returning to this later. I also wanted to take a moment to talk about some of the surface and subsurface mining specific impacts. In surface mining, uh, one of the most noticeable and obvious impacts is when we remove all of this overburden, we're removing an intact ecosystem and all of its topsoil. So the scarring and disruption of the land surface will be immense. You'll be able to see in this time lapse um, how a region in Al Alberta, Canada changes from 1984 1984 to 2018 as our mine site expands into this taiga, this coniferous forest to a very large mine site at the end. So here we are in 20 in 1984. Here's our mine site in 2018 and you can see there's been a massive removal of the ecosystem there which is a, a coniferous forest ecosystem. Of course, this means that we're going to be losing significant amounts of biodiversity. We'll be lo losing habitat spaces. We'll also be losing our topsoil as it gets just mixed into our general spoils pile. That tailings and spoils pile erodes easily, as I mentioned in the last slide, causing significant water pollution. And the lack of topsoil means that regrowth in this area is going to be really slow. 
because we're actually going to need to start with primary succession and regenerate topsoil before our deep-rooted grasses, our shrubs, and our trees can move back. Uh, mountaintop removal as a special type of surface mining is by far the most environmentally damaging. Uh, when you remove the top of a mountain, all of that stuff needs to go somewhere. And the most common place to put it is in the valley in between the mountain you're mining and the neighboring mountain. It's a natural spot to put all of that mountaintop. This is called a valley fill. A valley fill, valley fill is now a filled valley filled with all of the spoils from the mine site. That valley fill means that any streams that were there, and you know that you would expect a stream to be flowing in the bottom of a valley, all of those streams are buried. We're going to have major ecological disruption, of course, on the stream site itself that was buried, but then also downstream as all of that sediment gets flushed lower into the stream and into the river. Uh, and we're going to have increased flooding. Why would we have increased flooding? Well, when it rains, some of this water won't be able to go into the bottom of the valley where it's always gone. It's going to stay on top of this valley fill and it's going to flow down into areas that didn't normally experience large flows of water. I want to show you a industrial explosives video. This is the scale of the industrial explosives that are used dur during mountaintop removal. We put in our industrial explosives, we detonate them, and what we're left with is a pile of rubble that we can easily go and scoop out with a bunch of bulldozers. So what is the impact of this? Well, that blasting can lead to noise pollution. That noise pollution will impact humans living nearby, um, and it'll also impact wildlife. Many, many animals are sensitive to loud noises and will be chased out of the area, reducing biodiversity even more. That blasting, as you can see here, will cause significant air pollution. The sediment and dust that's kicked off um, will go pretty high and it can migrate down to communities. It can in impact the workers. Um, and as I said before, inhaling that dust is problematic for lung health. The blasting will also disrupt groundwater. So groundwater resources are frequently found below mountainous regions. And by blasting the top of the mountain, it's very likely that we're disrupting the rock layers underneath the mountain where the groundwater is stored. We might end up contaminating our groundwater. We might end up blocking our groundwater flow and you, uh, making a well um, barren and dry. Subsurface mining also has impacts, uh, but compared to surface mining, subsurface mining has fewer environmental impacts. One of the major environmental effects from subsurface mining is acid mine drainage. Acid mine drainage can come off of any mine site, but because many subsurface mines are coal mines that are rich in sulfur, we frequently see acid mine drainage coming out of subsurface mines. You already saw this picture of a abandoned coal mine site with a bunch of acid mine drainage coming out of it. Exposed mine shafts like these are hazardous to humans and to wildlife. If a deer or a human stumbles into an exposed mine shaft, it can be deadly. And we also see land sinking in. That's called subsidence over mine sites. Subsidence is when our land sinks. Uh, it can be as dramatic as a sinkhole, or it can just be a gradual dip in the land that can actually go as deep as 50, 60, 70 feet. Um, this happens when our mine sites cave in, when the rock is destabilized and all of a sudden the supporting rock is no longer supporting the land and it caves in. If our subsidence or our sinkholes happen near infrastructure, they can damage buildings, can damage sewer lines, can damage gas mains, and again, can disrupt groundwater flow as well. The biggest impact of subsurface mining is 
the human health impact. Mining in a confined space underground is extremely dangerous um, just to physical uh, life and health. There's a huge risk of cave-ins, explosions, and fires in subsurface mining. So here you can see a mine shaft that's experienced a cave-in. Here you can see a warning sign for an underground mine fire. Uh, abandoned coal mines can actually, and active coal mines, can catch fire. Coal is a flammable material, um, and that fire can burn essentially in perpetuity in this mine site. Uh, the other impact is an air pollution impact. When you're mining in a confined space, any air pollution that's generated, any dust that's kicked up is going to be extremely concentrated. It's not able to disperse itself into the air. And so subsurface miners frequently experience long-term respiratory diseases. One particular one to know is the black lung from coal mining. And that's a disease named such because after 20 to 30 years in a coal mine, all of the black uh, coal particles build up in lung tissue and actually stop oxygen from diffusing across this lung tissue into your blood, leading to respiratory failure. So there's Two other impacts of mining I'd like to tell you about, and they're both related to gold mining. Gold mining is a particularly interesting and hazardous kind of mining because the gold purification process involves some toxic chemicals. One method of gold purification is cyanide extraction. So cyanide will actually extract gold pretty readily from rocks. The process is down here. Cyanide will bond to gold, you'll add zinc, um, and then the zinc will remove the cyanide. Sulfuric acid will be added to wash away your zinc cyanide mixture, leaving with you with a paste of pure gold. What I hope you're familiar with is how toxic cyanide is. It will cause respiratory arrest. Um, and also how toxic sulfuric acid is. That's a strong acid that will burn living things. So we've got a bunch of toxic chemicals involved in this process. And the way it works is we create a uh, pay dirt heap like you can see in this real mine site from South Dakota. We add our cyanide on top of this heap. We allow it to percolate through the heap. Um, that cyanide will be washed away into our pregnant pond over here. In this pregnant pond, we'll add our zinc, we'll add our sulfuric acid, um, and then we will remove our gold paste and that liquid will flow into our barren ponds. And then the process will kind of start over. We'll keep doing that to keep extracting gold from our heaps. What I hope you notice is how exposed all of this is. It's exposed to the elements. We've just got mountains of cyanide-laced material here and ponds of cyanide and sulfuric acid-laced material. How is it held in place? How does it not become part of the, run the um, runoff and watershed? Well, you're required to have a thick plastic liner around all of these heaps and ponds. Um, but the EPA has been very forthright and, and shared that those plastic liners will eventually leak. There have been many gold mining accidents where these ponds or a heap um, has breached its plastic liner and cyanide or sulfuric acid has made its way into the watershed. Another method of gold purification involves mercury. Mercury will also dissolve gold. And when mercury dissolves gold, you can separate it fairly easily from the rock material and liquid that it's mixed in. Uh, and then you can boil off the mercury because it's got a very low boiling point. And then you're left with pure gold. This works well and it's used frequently in artisanal small scale gold mining. Um, however, what you may already know is that mercury is a potent neurotoxin and exposure to mercury has permanent health effects on all body systems, especially the nervous system, and it can cause irreparable brain damage. So how do we clean up a mine site? Well, we're going to be talking about the physical mine site itself and not as much the air pollution, water pollution, and human health impacts that may have resulted. But a physical mine site, the scarred landscape, how do we clean this up? How do we remediate it? How do we get it back 
to the ecosystem that it was before. Well, the first thing that we need to do is we need to recontour the land. Uh, if our mine site was originally a hilly mountainous area, ideally we return it to that shape. In practice, it's impossible to return it to that shape. That mine site um, is now a pile, now consists of a bunch of piles of gravel and dirt and rock and no amount of stabilization will convince them to be as strong and sturdy as a solid mountain was before. The second thing we need to do is replace our lost topsoil. Uh, how are we going to do this? Frequently we do this by adding fertilizers, uh, chemical fertilizers straight to our spoils piles and calling it a day. We then need to replant our region. One of the most common replanting efforts is grass seed because of its fast growth. Some countries will require that the ecosystem is replanted with the dominant plant type that was there before. So you can see on the left, a mine site that's been replanted with grass seed. On the right, this is a mine site that's been replanted with uh, conifer trees. You can see the intentional rows of replanting. It's all the same species over and over. In both situations, we've essentially got a monoculture, one species planted in this area. So we're not restoring our full biodiversity that we had before. And then finally, the monitoring has to be a part of mining remediation. Uh, it's critical that mining companies are held to monitor the mine sites that they are busy remediating and reclaiming and make sure that, say, a flash flood or a forest fire doesn't destroy um, the new ecosystem that's being planted on top of the mine site. There's some alternatives to mining remediation. We can use some sneaky things like wetlands. Wetlands are actually fabulous for trapping and filtering pollutants before they get into streams. It's pretty expensive to restore a wetland or even generate a wetland around a mine site but it's cost effective compared to using lime, crushed up limestone, to decrease acidity. So uh, acid mine drainage flowing into a wetland will be remediated, will be trapped and uh, removed pretty quickly. And many of the plants that are in this wetland can actually tolerate that acid mine drainage. We can also use something called phytoremediation. There's certain plants that can absorb and accumulate toxic materials from the soil. soil. Um, there's some plants that can remove mercury from the soil and bind it up inside the plant itself. Obviously, you wouldn't want to eat that plant, but if that plant is left undisturbed, it can be a toxic material sink, removing that material from the soil and sequestering it for a long time. There are some bioremediation efforts. So bioremediation is specifically used for acid mine drainage in the presence of sulfuric acid. There are some bacteria that are sulfate reducing that can essentially chew up the sulfuric acid and decrease the acidity of the acid mine drainage or decrease the acidity of the soil. So finally, let's talk about our use of these mineral resources. Can we use these mineral resources sustainably? How should we do that? Well, the first thing to note is that these are non-renewable resources. So any use of these resources that doesn't involve 100% reuse uh, or maybe recycling will not be sustainable. But with that in mind, uh, it's important to know that there's a few countries that supply many of the world's non-renewable mineral resources. These resources are not evenly distributed worldwide. There's also a few countries that consume many of the world's non-renewable mineral resources. Mineral resource use is not distributed evenly worldwide either. In the U.S., we generate a variety of mineral resources. We actually have to import most of our mineral resources because we consume them at such a high rate. Our per capita non-renewable mineral resource use has sharply gone up since 19, 1950. This should not be a surprise. And that's also what this chart on the right is showing. And finally, control of mineral resources is considered an economic and military strategy. Think about how we use these mineral resources. 
tungsten, which is used um, to strengthen steel. It's used in electronics. Um, we use a variety of mineral resources in building aircraft, in building machinery. Control of these mineral resources is critical both to our economy um, and to a strong military. So how fast are we using up our mineral resources? Well, an important term to know is depletion time. This is the time that it takes to use up 80% of the reserves of a mineral. Remember, the reserves are all of the deposits that we know about and that we can profitably extract. So this depletion time, how long it takes up to use 80% of our mineral deposits, this depends on a variety of factors. It depends on whether or not we're recycling the mineral. If we're recycling the mineral resource, we're not going to mine it as much, and so it will take us longer to hit our depletion time. Are we reusing this material? Same deal. More reuse, less mining, longer depletion time. What's our rate of consumption like? Are we consuming it quickly? If we're consuming it quickly, we'll need to mine it more rapidly, uh, and our deplet depletion time will be shorter or will come sooner. Rate of extraction, how quickly are we mining it? High rate of extraction, short depletion time. Are we discovering new reserves? If we discover new reserves, that 80% is now a larger quantity and that's gonna extend our depletion time. What about better mining technology? Well, if we have better mining technology, that might increase our reserves or it might make our low grade ore more profitable. Maybe we can extract more of our resource from our ore um, and that effectively increases the amount of resource we're extracting at a time. That would lead to a longer depletion time. And also changing demand for the mineral will uh, change our depletion time. If we find a replacement for the mineral, that will extend our depletion time because we're gonna be using it at a slower rate. So what you can see here on the right are three depletion curves. A depletion curve shows us the production of that mineral versus time. And in a depletion curve in a mineral that's just used, thrown away, no new discoveries, getting more expensive, higher demand, we're going to see a really rapid production increase. And then we're going to hit this point where we've exhausted about 50% and our production is going to be falling until we hit 80% depletion. That's our depletion time before we quickly run out. We can extend that depletion time and kind of flatten our production curve by recycling, increasing our reserves, raising prices, making new discoveries. We can extend that even further by reducing our use of the resource by finding even more discoveries, more reserves by finding a replacement for the material. So in terms of sustainability, our goal here is really to flatten these production curves and lengthen our depletion time. One thing that many mining companies are thinking about is the possibility of mining low-grade ore. Our reserves would be dramatically increased for pretty much all mineral resources if we could mine our lower-grade ore profitably. But right now, there's many low-grade ores where if we put in the labor and the energy and the fuel to mine those resources, we wouldn't get enough of a profit out um, at the other side to be worthwhile. As mining technology improves, we may be able to make a profit. Um, that's the biggest uh, roadblock to mining low-grade low ore. But one thing to think about is that if we're mining low-grade ore, that means that we're going to need to take a whole bunch more ore out of the ground, and that would definitely increase our land disturbance. Similarly, that would increase our water usage, that would increase our water pollution as well. There are other mineral deposits that are not on land. They are deep in the ocean. And I mentioned before that dredging, dredging works for shallow bodies of water, but not for deep bodies of water because you just can't get a bucket chain that's long and stable enough. So the, the biggest thing to know, let me back up. Some minerals are dissolved in seawater. That's one possible source of minerals from the ocean. We could just extract the seawater boil off the water and be left with minerals that we could refine further. 
However, the concentration is too low to mine profitably. The only mineral resources that we can extract profitably from seawater are salts. Some deposits of mineral resources are found along continental shelves, so that's one of our shallower areas of the ocean. And some deposits are found in the deep ocean near hydrothermal vents. This is a picture of a hydrothermal vent, a diagram, that shows how at a hydrothermal vent, this is a region where we have magma actually bubbling to the surface bubbling up through the crust. And that magma is extremely mineral rich. So it makes sense that we're going to have a lot of mineral deposits right around our hydrothermal vents. We just don't have the technology to make this profitable. Uh, there's no agreement as to who owns which parts of the ocean floor. We don't have dredging technology that we can operate at a low enough fuel cost to make this profitable. And environmentally, there are major concerns about the effects of ocean floor mining on aquatic life. Okay, so that was a lot of information. Feel free to go back and rewatch any section. Thanks for watching this lecture on rocks and mining, and we'll see you in class.